obviously I can't do this on my own, so I'm joined as ever with my co-host Jack Rowe. Jack, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I was uh, watching at the pub at the, at the weekend, and uh, it was a pretty good race, so I'm, I'm looking forward to today. Yes, yes. I mean, it was an all right race, I'd say. No, I think it was a good race. Oh, I, okay. I think it was a good race. We'll, 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 talk, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But, of course, we're also joined by Chinmay. How are you doing, Chinmay? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, Turkish Grand Prix, there were some good bits, there were some not so good bits, but it's definitely a race with a lot of talking points. Yeah, and I mean, and we'll basically jump, I guess we'll jump into it straight away. So I'll run through the finishing order quickly. <laughs> so we had Bottas taking his first win of the season with Verstappen and Perez in second and third. Leclerc in a very good fourth. Hamilton climbing from 11th to 5th. Gasly, Norris and Sainz in, oh, Sainz in 6th, 7th and 8th. Sainz climbing from, I think it was 19th uh, the, uh, on the starting grid. Stroll and Ocon rounding out the top 10 with Ocon ta- being the first driver, I think, since 1997 to do a whole race on one set of tyres. Then just out of the points, we had Giovinazzi, Raikkonen, Ricardo, Sonoda, Russell, Alonso, Latifi, Vettel, Mick Schumacher and Nikita Mazepin. So we may as well start with, may as well start with the person in first, I think. It's, it's, you've got to talk about him. It's Valtteri Bottas. Like, he seems to be blowing very hot and cold at the moment. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, good for him that he's got the victory, I think. Uh, uh, I don't know. People have started to warm to him since... Well, I don't think started. Like, immediately warm to him once he announced he was going to leave Mercedes. And, yeah, since that point, he's had a... He, he, has, he has blown hot and cold. We saw in... Uh, Sochi, that weird, that weird thing. We would kind of like semi defend against Verstappen, but not really. And then yeah, this weekend he's just been on a rampage. So uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of him. Yeah, so we've had Zanvor, Sochi, uh, Italy, and now Turkey since um, he announced he was moving. Right. So he's had a third, another third, but from the back of the grid, so a very good third. A fifth but a fairly lucky fifth so i guess that cancels out yeah he wouldn't have been fifth if it weren't for the rain right at the end would yeah it? and then obviously he's um he's returned to the top step of the podium i mean did you think bottas was going to win at the at sort of like at the start of the weekend maybe after ham after we knew hamilton was going to be taking a 10 place grid penalty do you, did you think that bottas was going to be the one that would sort of like take the place at the top step for the mercedes to be brutally honest, I was kind of expecting Hamilton to just fly f- through the field within 10 laps and then just win the whole race within with a two-minute lead or something, especially with the pace he showed in Turkey last year with the way he really used those, let's call them interslicks, shall we, to really grab a commanding win to win his seventh world championship. But, yeah, it's... Obviously, Bottas also showed the pace and was clearly faster than both the Red Bulls. So, yeah, there was I felt kind of, there was an even chance for either Mercedes to take the win here. Yeah, and I mean, it does seem to be what a lot of people were sort of hoping from Valtteri Bottas, especially when he joined Mercedes in 2017. Like, sort of, this was probably his most dominant drive outside of Sochi, and we all know he's like traditionally really good at Sochi, but we haven't really seen that sort of dominance from from like from like him at Mercedes but this is just a really good performance wasn't it yeah he's not been very good in the rain recently either has he um in the last couple of years especially um but yeah this time he just kind of he went out there he performed well um I'm sure we'll come on to it later but some people might argue it's because of the um and en- maybe engine upgrades that we've seen from Mercedes recently um and maybe that's why they maybe that's why he took the engine penalty um uh in uh it was Sochi wasn't it uh, yes. yeah uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, y- yeah I mean he came to Mercedes and I think people wanted him to challenge Hamilton and he never really did but I think if he could pull that off every week um there'd be some debate over whether he could or not of course Hamilton wasn't there to challenge and we'll come on to that later again I'm sure but um, yeah that that does make a difference too if Hamilton was in second if Hamilton qualified well he qualified on pole didn't he really um, except for the 10 places um, then we might be we might be talking about something different but 
but yeah, I mean, this is sort of the Bottas, not the Bottas of old, like you're talking your 13 to 16, but like early Mercedes Bottas was still up there, still performing. Obviously, I think 17 was probably his best season. 18, he got quite unlucky not to get a win, I'd say. Azerbaijan, definitely, where he got that puncture in the final few laps. But even in 2019, he was still performing. And I think the problem that Bottas has had is that he is against one of the best drivers of all time. And if Hamilton isn't there, he has to perform. But often, like oftentimes, Hamilton is there, and there's not really much he can do about it, is there? No, not really. I mean, Lewis, Lewis Hamilton this year, to be honest, he has shown that he is not an absolute perfect driver. He's made the mistakes, but the problem, but the thing is, Hamilton has just been able to show how good he is with those recovery drives. I mean, um, think about Turkey last year when he literally just flew the flew through the field, overtook Lance Stroll, and literally dominated the race towards the end in what was one of his best drives of his career, I would say. Whereas Bottas, for some reason, doesn't seem to have the same sort of abilities as Hamilton to fly through the field whenever he makes a mistake. I mean, was it Italy twenty nine, twenty Italy last year where I think Bottas was struggling to go through the field, and then there's Hamilton, just despite was literally flying. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and that is sort of the thing, isn't it? That Hamilton has always been able to put in those consistent performances. Maybe not. This year, it seems like he is on a bit of a downwards trajectory, and we will get onto that. But last year, I'd say from like 17 to 20 was like Pete Lewis Hamilton, in that like even if he was starting outside the top 10, which he didn't do often, you always felt that he would be up there. I think a lot of that was the cars, and that the top three teams then were so far ahead of the midfield, and you don't really get that now. Obviously, we've had McLaren, Ferrari challenging for wins we've had um Ocon in the Alpine winning a race we've had um just the like Gasly has always been up there and the midfield drivers are a lot closer but with Bottas like you always felt if it was an off day for Bottas he never really got going and we've seen that this season we've seen it in Imola in Baku and as you mentioned in Italy last season when you would think that with a lot of Bottas's rivals out of the picture he's got to get up there and take that win. He didn't really do it. Yeah, I think Bottas has always struggled with overtaking, with something we should have mentioned earlier, really. But uh, when Chin Mei brought it up, I was like, yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, when I don't, There's something about some driver and car combinations and they just, their, either their confidence or something just doesn't quite connect when they're side by side with another driver and we saw it from um well daniel ricardo this weekend but also we see it from bottas in the mercedes a lot and yeah i think as you as you said um the closer the field gets the more and more that that comes into um into frame for for him so yeah it's a shame you know hopefully next year will be better maybe the alfa romeo will suit him suit him more um we'll have to just have to see won't we yeah, and as you said, he is going to Alfa Romeo next season. And in a move that I think a lot of people are sort of happy with, I think Alfa Romeo seem to be happy with it. And I know there's been rumours, haven't there, of Andretti buying the team and renaming it to, I guess, Andretti Salva, which I think in the long term might open the door for a few American drivers to come over. But for the next few seasons, especially 2022 with the new regulations, you want that driver that's got that experience and Bottas brings that, and he brings good performances on his day. And maybe maybe he's always had the car set up um, at Mercedes for where it's, like, not good for overtaking. But if he's got a car that is good at overtaking, as you will have to do in an Alfa Romero unless somehow somehow they're at the top of the field next season, then... Or really far at the back. <laughs> we, we, don't, we hope not. We hope no one is far at the that's, back. That's a very per- pessimistic view. Sorry, I've interrupted you. No, Keep it's going. fine. It's fine. But I think, wouldn't you agree that Alfa Romeo is arguably the best place that Bottas could go? I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, not just that. I think Alfa's done a good move, bringing somebody like Valtteri Bottas, who has experience in a t- being in a top team for the past four or five years now. 
and bring, he can bring that experience to Alfa Romeo to help really set up that team for the future. And then not just that, especially with the with the high rumors of either Oscar Piastri or even Guan Yu, or more likely Guan Yu Jia at the moment coming to the team. Bottas can really act as a really good mentor for that new driver to develop themselves as a fully fledged racing driver for Formula One. Yeah, that's a good point because obviously. The Alfa Romeo second seat is the final one that doesn't appear to be looking or looking to be filled into into next season. I mean, there's Guan Yu Zhou, Oscar Piastri. There's like, do they keep Giovinazzi and wait for Porcher in 2023? I think there's lots of different options, and it's good that they've got that one constant or constant in the. Bottas can come in, can uh, steady the team, especially if they're going through ownership changes as well. Yeah, I could talk for hours and hours and hours about F2 um, and driver progression and stuff like that. So uh, this isn't quite the time. Maybe I'll do it in in, uh, one of my weeks in the future. But um, I'm literally just (laughs) going to have to make a mental note of that. But um, yeah, no, it's... uh, I'm glad they're leaving that seat open. Fred Vassar has said recently that um, they're going to wait till the end of the season, and I'd like to see more teams do that because there is absolutely, at the moment, great talent in F2, um, and I think they should get a youngster in because alongside Bottas, he is, you know, maybe apart from Vettel, probably one of the most experienced um, drivers who is available on the market. Mm. Um yeah, you said earlier whether Alfa Romeo is the ideal team. I'd say a midfield team. Um, obviously, there are some there are some teams he can't go to, but maybe Alpine could have um, yeah taken out Fernando Alonso. I don't know, but um, don't get too mad at me about saying that. <laughs> yeah, I mean Bottas is like one of the most uh, experienced drivers on the grid. So we've got obviously the uh the big or the now Raikkonen's retiring got the three of like our childhoods which is like your Vettels Hamiltons and probably your Alonzos and then you've got sort of the two that came in in the sort of like it was the weird years I saw someone mentioned it in our F1 like WhatsApp group is that the years from 10 to 14 have really like there aren't that many drivers that lasted, and the three I can think of that did were Ricardo, Sainz, and, and Bottas. Yeah, and you'd have said Grosjean as well. Yeah, but just, I mean, I'd say just that would remain in the sport. Yeah. And I think, like, just to end off, I think that Bottas is a good driver. I think that he did deserve his Mercedes seat, but maybe it just didn't work out. I think... No, it's not just Bottas, but I think don't do this in the bad way. But the problem is Hamilton because who you needed who is going to be able to really challenge Hamilton on a regular basis when Hamilton is performing at the level he has been performing in the last few years alone. Yeah, I mean, not much else you can say, and obviously we hope that this helps Bottas uh, get a few more wins just before his final few races at Mercedes. Jack, you're looking like he's not going to do that. Yeah, that's pr- I think that's fairly optimistic. Again, we're going to come on to it. We'll see how Mercedes do, but with the championship the way it is, um, <coughs> unless Lewis has to take another um, another engine change, we might not see that, I don't think. Yeah, but I, well, yeah when- there's a good chance I'm proven wrong, let's be honest. Yeah, but let's, we'll hope, let's hope so. Welcome back to the Warwick F1 show. I mean, so, we always want rain. And we've we've had a lot of it this year, to be fair. I can't think of a season that we've had for a long time. What, this is the fourth wet race? Imola, <laughs> Russia, Turkey. Spa. Spa, technically. Is there any others? And I will run out of, <laughs> we'll uh, of airtime if we keep but, thinking about it. But, but even even then, this is the four like the fourth wet race that we've had this season, and that is a that's a lot of. I, wet I races. definitely count Spa. Spa was wet yeah. enough to count. I think it's, it's, it's not about whether that was wet. I think it's about whether that was a race. But um, we had another wet race here at Turkey, like we did last year. But this one didn't really deliver. I mean, why why do you think that was? What what do, you, what do you mean it didn't deliver on the rain or the the racing quality? Because well, that one of those is very much up for debate. So I would say that when you when you get a wet race, you're expecting the race to be like upper echelon. You're talking like your best. Like 
the best races of most seasons are normally wet. But this one, I'd say, definitely wasn't as bad as, like, the two Austrias, Monaco, Zandvoort. Mm. But we've had, what, 16 races now? I don't think it would squeeze much past my top 10. I don't, I don't agree with you. I, I really like that kind of race, because you sit there and you're like, why aren't they ping? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? I like the strategy part of it. So you might as well come to Chimme, because I'm just, I'm just going to sit out this part of the conversation if you keep bad-mouthing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I will come to you, Chimme. Um, so, obviously, as I've said, I, I think this race was solid, like, 10th, 9th for the season. And we, what we'll do at the end of the end of the season is go through, like, what we thought were some of the best and worst races. But would you say this one was... Like, would you... I mean, Jack, where are you putting it? Like, top five things? Something like no, that? No, it wasn't, like, a banger, but it, I th- I would put it, yeah, fifth or sixth, I think. Okay. Fifth or May- sixth? It think? might have, it might have been the pub atmosphere. It might have been that, you know, you go you go with your friends um, at Warwick F1 Society. No plugs happening. Um, <laughs> uh, and and you're there. But, no, I did enjoy it. Um, and there were, there were plenty of moments to talk about, right? I think, also, it's a championship battle. Yeah. Um... Maybe, you know, if that's, if that's, um, I don't know, uh, Perez coming through the pack from um, 11th to 5th, then it's not quite so exciting. Yeah. But okay. Maybe, maybe with the context, I'm being a bit harsh. But I mean, Jim, give us your thoughts. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna, I completely agree with the with Jack. With like these sort of conditions, yes, it didn't dry out, but it, it kind of added like a lot of tension. Like, why is no one pitting? Is like, or are the how long are the tires gonna last? Because we've never really been in this sort of position where people were using the intermediates as slick tires. I mean, we did we did see this last year in Turkey as well, but like we never really seen this properly for the whole race itself, where people were literally using. Into slicks or slick to mediates, so however you like yeah. to call it. I would like to say whoever made up slick to mediates should be fired. It's into slicks. It's only into slicks. And I've heard I, slinters. So that's slinters, <laughs> slinters just sounds painful. But I guess actually what we'll do is provide a bit of context. So Turkey last year had just been resurfaced. And when a track gets resurfaced, you've got all your oils and your moistures coming from like the tarmac being laid. And they're still coming out of the circuit. So last year, the, it was ice. Like, they drivers couldn't get any grip. I'm pretty sure the FP1 times, there was about a 12-second difference from last year to this year. And even with the new, uh, obviously, the updated cars, it shouldn't be that much. This year, they'd water-blasted the tracks to give it a bit more friction, a bit more abrasiveness. Obviously, that increases grip. But then, again, we saw a damp track like we did last year, which, again... <laughs> takes away from the, away from the grip and what we were seeing is we were seeing drivers almost thinking about going to the end on their one set of intermediates you can't do that in the dry you need to run to two sets of tires or two different compounds but in the wet you don't have to do that you can run run those tires to the end and we did see one driver do that didn't we jack we did. Esteban Ocon, uh, absolutely hats off to the man. That was that was a mental job. Have you seen the state of his tyres afterwards? Oh, yeah. Whoa, terrifying. He did he did hit the cliff right at the end. M- maybe that wasn't the best strategy call, but I mean the cojones on that man to keep going with that single set of tyres for fifty two laps or. I think it's more. I think it's fifty-eight. Laps. Fifty. Yeah. Sorry. That's yeah. En- encyclopedia <laughs> F one, etc., etc. Um, yeah, no, I, I do watch the races, I promise. I was there. Uh, yeah, he, he's... Uh, hats off to him. But yeah, I mean, so he, he did hit the cliff right at the end. I think he lost something like 52 seconds to Carlos Sainz in the final 14 laps. So it's not a great strategy. And obviously we'll come on to some other drivers who felt that they could have done the zero stop. But I mean, first time we've seen a zero stop in our lifetimes. The last time was... 1997 Monaco, Mikasalo taking the last points of Tyrrell. I don't. I didn't know. I hope you've looked. I hope you've looked that. No, I didn't know that before. It's because I mean, it's one of those stats. You're like, we don't. We've never seen a zero stop. We've seen uh, some drivers red flag to change tires. I think Lance Stroll. That was technically what he did last season in Italy. And I know quite a few drivers did that 
in Brazil uh, 2016, but it's not something that we see. You don't see a driver just not pit at all. Yeah, I mean, especially with the, the typical design that Pirelli does to these tyres to make him deliberately last half a race distance, at, probably at most. I mean, yeah, it's just really astonishing to see Esteban Ocon really push those tyres to the absolute limits. Yeah, and another thing that we saw was that it was just wasn't drying either. I think that was the track surface, but another driver that had um, or pit stop pit stop like this drama of his own was Sebastian Vettel, who I think we all took, saw, took a double take when we saw him come into the pits and put on the medium tyre about, I think it was 40 laps in. Yeah, those uh, the uh, Inters are, of course, green tyres uh, and the, the slicks are yellow, so you can't really see the difference and um, for for first couple seconds. So I think we uh, neither of us had, like heard the radio properly um, in the pub, but the, I, I imagine I've heard it. I've watched the highlights again. Crofty was a little bit incredulous. I think I think we all were because the chat wasn't dry enough. And I think if it had worked, obviously it would have been a masterstroke. Yeah, but it wasn't. It, it it was so far away from working. It was insane. Like. Yeah. You need a dry line. I think most people knew by whenever it was. He was in the 30s of laps or maybe even like lap 40 or mm. something. Um, most people knew by that stage it just wasn't drying at all. Like it wasn't going to dry. So, yeah. It's w- way, way closer to the end of Stupid than it was to the end of Brave, I yeah. think. And I mean, Timmy, why don't you, why don't you clarify what happened to Vettel on his one lap on the medium tyres? <laughs> Uh, can I call it Spinola even though he's still in a Ferrari I don't think he's, he did he he's spin or was it I mean, just a lot of it. like drifting off at every yeah. single corner he did on the pit entry didn't he yeah he did spin on pit entry but yeah at least, at least he didn't manage to crash into anybody or cause a lot of havoc on the track so at least he did didn't do anything that disastrous with the tyres yeah, and I mean, I think what we're getting at here is that there wasn't enough grip, and he pitted instantly afterwards. But I mean, was it? Why? Why do you think it wasn't drying? Was it drizzle? Was it the track surface? Obviously, we sort of had it last year as well. It wasn't raining, but it wasn't drying, and maybe it's just a new track surface, a bit of drizzle coming in, or maybe something else. Yeah, there was a little bit where there was uh, rain. I think I can't remember who it was. Maybe Sainz or Leclerc. Uh, said there was rain in turns nine and ten at one point, but it was just the uh, the humidity. It was just the air was damp. It was it wasn't foggy, but it was like it was just grim. You know, there's there's no temperature in the air. It's October um, and it, it's full of moisture already. So they just they didn't do anything. And once those inters start to go a little bit flatter, they don't churn up so much water, uh, and that's going to slow it down even more. So yeah. And that was the thing that happened. What we saw was the return of, obviously, as you mentioned, the Interslick. Anyone that calls it Slickters will not be allowed on the show. Uh, but yeah, the Interslick, Interslick returned, um, and you were seeing a lot of lot of tyres coming off, and they were just um, they were just like Slicks in the middle, and then a bit of Inter on the outside. And it's incredibly impressive that the drivers can go around the track in or on tires like that especially after what we've seen with like lando norris last race how difficult it is to drive on uh drive on like slick tires in the wet like that's that it's incredibly impressive what they were doing going like 40 50 laps on those tires that were like slicks in the middle i mean yeah it's I bet it must have been really a nerve wracking for not just the drivers driving the car, but also the teams on the pit wall at the pit walls as well. Because we have we really pretty much never have been in a situation where the intermediates become slick tires, and the just the tension. Like even Pirelli, Pirelli didn't really know how long the tires would actually last. So yeah, it was really intense to see how long the drivers could really stretch it, and yeah, it was impressive. Yeah, and there was actually a reason, Jack, why the drivers weren't pitting, wasn't there? Uh, I'm, uh, oh, I'm, uh, well, oh no! Oh no! Okay. <laughs> well, uh, okay. I'll, I've watched a, I watched an Anthony Davidson video that sort of explained it. So, when the when you put the new tires on, obviously they're getting Are you rid talking of about tire temperature. Yeah. Tire yes. Temperature. Okay. All right. I do vaguely know what I'm talking. So about. <laughs> when they put the new tires on, 
uh, it's just a standard inter. It's clearing the water and things like that. But because there isn't that much water, it overheats quite quickly, and you lose the lo- the sort of the little bit that's got the grooves in that uh, does clear the water. And when you're losing that, the tires are nowhere. They're overheating. They're sliding all over the place. And we saw that with a lot of drivers. Uh, we saw that with Daniel Ricciardo when he pitted quite early. Yeah, he so got- what, what happens is the tyre falls apart and then it sticks to itself and then you just get a rough surface, but not the kind of rough surface that gets rid of the water. You get the rough surface that just means you don't have as much tyre contact. Yeah, and so while, yeah, while that was taking place, you were ve- it was very difficult to drive. So if you were off sync, like Daniel Ricciardo got overtaken by both the uh, Alfa Romeos in one or one or two corners... Um, Hamilton, we'll come on to him later, looked like he was going to get Leclerc, but then dropped back into the clutches of Gasly and Norris. And I mean, it was... Again, we say how, like, 2020 Turkey was a unique race. I'd say this was one of the most unique races as well. Yeah, it was. Like, say, we've never seen these conditions before. The mist, and the mist and the fog just adding to that really damn line. It's... Yeah, it's just really, really bizarre to watching the conditions unfold during the race. Yeah, and I mean, it's a shame. It's a shame we're not coming back here. But we'll go for another song, and when we come back, we'll talk about, I guess, the driver that had the most action during the race, and possibly the one that's had the most fallout after the race. That being Lewis Hamilton. And that was Scarlet by Holly Humberstone. And welcome back to the Warwick F1 show, where we are moving on to talk about the man, well, I guess maybe not the man of the moment, but the person everyone associates with F1, uh, the greatest driver of all time, obviously, in my opinion, Lewis Hamilton, who had, I don't know, would you say he had a good race? Uh, I mean... Pace-wise, definitely yes. Strategy-wise, maybe not. I mean, what, I, we'll get on to that, I'm sure. But yeah, he, he looks fast. He does well in the rain. He could have gotten past Sonoda quicker, but once he got up to speed, got his tyres in the, in the working range, which Mercedes, to be fair, have always had a problem with. Once he was there, he was absolutely gunning down, you know, just one after the other, after the other, after the other, until about the mid-race. Yeah. So, um, obviously, we have, we've had Lewis Hamilton. He's taken a tempo. He's put it on... Actually, we'll talk about that first. He's put it on pole. Do you think, like... Obviously, that's a Valtteri, a Bottas pole, technically. But do you think that should have, should have been a Hamilton pole? Do you think the, the record should say that Hamilton has got pole, but then got a tempo grid penalty, as opposed to getting a tempo grid penalty after or before like the poll is decided i mean for hamilton to put in all that effort to put in the fastest lap of the session and what technically would be first the first place but yeah i would say definitely should have been hamilton poll yeah and i think i think to be honest it's something a lot uh verstappen seemed to agree with obviously he was joking around that uh that they were like Hamilton has enough tyres for a factory, but obviously we come on to the race. He starts eleventh, a fairly standard start, gains a position because Alonso spins. But then he's like he's attacking a lot of drivers, and he's getting past them quickly, isn't he? Yeah, I I, I want to come back and have my say very very quickly on that. Um, F one, especially with sprint races, especially with uh, what Mister Domenicale said this week about having a whole a whole load more. Um, next season, they need a distinction between who's the fastest qualifier and who's sitting on the front row. You know, the the the, the pole position, if you like. Um, yeah, sorry. What, what remind so me the question? Just, he, just, start of the race for Hamilton. Yeah, start of the race. Yeah, yeah. S- Sonoda bizarrely managed to hold him up for a good few laps there, but um, uh, well, I say bizarrely because he then went on to spin and finish outside the points. I think it was 14. Yeah, not not great for him throughout the rest of the race. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a decent start for Sonoda anyway. Um, but yeah, it comes back again to Mercedes not being able to get those tyres in, I think. Um, but once he got going, there was uh, he went around the outside of Sonoda, didn't he? That was a great move. That got everyone hyped. Yeah, it was at turn yeah. turn three. I don't think I think I was having lunch at that point. I don't think I was paying attention. <laughs> 
Oh no, I was. I'd gone to make lunch. I was watching it for like the first few laps, and then I went to make lunch, and he immediately got past as soon as I, as soon as I wasn't watching. To be fair, it happened with Bottas and Leclerc at the same time. So basically, all the overtakes happened while I wasn't watching the race. <laughs> it's it's always typical, isn't it? You, you're surprised if, if you managed to finish lunch by the time he'd hunted down whoever was next on his menu. I can't remember Ooh. who was. Oh god, it's a challenge now. We, re- isn't it? we really should know who was Gasly. He ever took Gasly? No, no, Gasly no. was later. Was it Ocon? Or was Ocon behind him? He well, he ever took someone, <laughs> and we can't remember who it was. But anyway, so I go. We get. He gets up to fifth. He's behind, obviously, Bottas in first, Verstappen and Leclerc in second and third, and then Perez in fourth. And he has the best battle of the, He has the best battle of the race with Perez. I mean, we haven't really seen that from Sergio Perez, who had a good start to the season, but really hasn't performed over the last few races. I mean, yeah, it's a bit surprising. Somebody like Sergio Perez, who has a reputation for being one of the most consistent drivers on the grid and is, has one of the best known abilities to manage his tyres during a race. Yeah, it's pretty surprising that he hasn't re like Gasly and Albon before him to really bring that Red Bull, the second Red Bull close to Verstappen throughout most of the season. Yeah, I mean... But yeah, it's good to see Perez finally stepping up after, I think, was it Baku the last time he really did a good performance at a Red Bull holding up Hamilton. And then that few that few corners at the end of lap 34 was just epic to watch. Just seeing them both go side by side and that's when once and then down the pit straight when Hamilton seemed to get the better Perez and then Perez just diving down at turn one. It was just excellent racing. I mean, were you, I mean... I can't imagine what the atmosphere was like in the in the pub, Jack, when you saw Hamilton and Vettel go wheel to wheel. It was mental. There was shouting and yelling and and hands on heads everywhere. Um, there was, I think, the only time it got louder was uh, the when Alonso spun because there are quite a few people who like Alonso there. But yeah, no, that was good. It was it was. You don't often find that kind of like at that point in the race. Maybe you see that in the last few laps or, or or you know you know at the pit stops um but at, you know two-thirds of the way through the race that doesn't normally happen does it yeah and i mean i think i said this uh, last week i said that the last sector at turkey was desi- it's very good that if you do go in side by side you are going to get that and i was proved right so i'm very, very happy about that but it was almost the thing that cost hamilton I guess a chance, maybe not a chance at a podium, but maybe a chance at getting up there and maybe guaranteeing that podium instead of having to do what he ended up doing. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say a chance at a podium. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I've got not not got anything anything to add to that really. Um, he Perez was absolutely phenomenal into that uh, into that first corner because he was a full car lengths behind, wasn't he? It wasn't that it wasn't that. Perez defended his position. You see, he lost it and then and then stuck it back down the inside again. And against Hamilton, who's a master in the wet, absolutely well done, massive, massive well done for for Sergio. Yeah, and I guess what we'll do is we'll move on to the final stage of the race, where Perez had pitted. Obviously, uh, he felt it was the best decision to do. Uh, Verstappen and Bottas had pitted. So and then we were left with Leclerc and Hamilton. Leclerc pitted on lap. I want to say forty something. For I think he he pitted after Bottas overtook him. But then we were left with Lewis Hamilton and Esteban Ocon. Obviously, we know Ocon went to the end. But on lap fifty, Hamilton came in and then wasn't exactly happy about where he ended up coming out. Yeah, I mean, he ended up back behind Perez and then trying to get back to Perez and Leclerc and ended up being closer to where Gasly and Norris was almost right on his tail. I mean, of course, Lewis wouldn't have been happy. And yeah, I guess we'll just... And also the radio was a bit interesting as well. Yeah. About... So we'll, we'll come to the radio uh, in a bit, but... Jack, do you think he could have got to the end on that one set of tyres? Do you think he could have? And if he had gone to the end on that one set of tyres, where do you think he would have finished? 
I mean, it's really hard to say because we don't know how he was using his tyres. Our only comparison is Ocon. And again, we don't know how hard Ocon was using his tyres. We didn't really see that, uh, much of much of his race. So if his tyres had done the same, the exact same uh, lap for lap as what Ocon would have done, he would have been losing time hand over fist in the last uh, few laps. And, you know, he might be down to... Now, he'd probably be down to where he was anyway. There's a very small chance he holds on to that P3 or P4. Um, but then there's the, also the the uh, risk of him just blowing a tyre altogether. So very fine margins there. And I just don't think you can predict what would have happened if he did stay out. Yeah, I mean, Kimmo, do you sort of agree? Because obviously he wasn't third. I don't think he knew that he would have come at, like was going to come out in fifth. But then, uh, so he did third. Will he make it to the end? Obviously, he's had to overtake a lot of people in the first uh, half of the race. But uh, then, it, like, he's always been good at conserving his tyres. So do you think that Hamilton maybe would have been able to make it to the end without the sort of time loss that we saw from Ocon? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is hard to tell, of course, because the only person we have for reference is Esteban Ocon, who is in a completely different car, and we don't know how hard he was using the tyres compared to Hamilton. And obviously, we did see that tyres drop of were actually falling off the cliff right towards the end because the clear with this fresher set of inters was closing into Ham closing to Hamilton probably about a second lap so would have been even with Hamilton and managed to keep his tyres going until the end of the race last couple of laps he would have had to battle with Leclerc who would have had much better pace because of that fresher intermediate yeah I mean it would have been quite an exciting thing to see but then obviously Mercedes pit may be the correct decision maybe not but one person that definitely didn't think it was the correct decision during the race was Lewis Hamilton himself. So we'll, we'll start with sort of what he said on the radio. I mean, do you think he was sort of justified in sort of like saying what he said? I mean, wh what are we referring to specifically? So just like, just, just like his general comments. Like, he, well, yeah, it's in the race. You don't like losing positions. And I think it's... You, you, we watch on telly, the commentators have their say on strategy, the drivers have their say on strategy, we have say on strategy, um, but we just don't have the information that the teams do, and generally, we're not as good as it, I think, um, and yeah, so he should have pitted, what lap did they try and call him in, 40, 41, 42? Yeah, I think it was yeah. early 40s. Yeah, uh, uh, it was just after Perez pitted, wasn't it? So yeah, they should. he should have listened to that, and if he didn't do that, then... He's got to accept responsibility for that or, you know, say, now the strategy is in my hands. Um, and again, I wasn't, I was in the pub, didn't hear it. I don't know if it was his call to come in um, eventually or, or not. Um, we, you got, you know, no, 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 sorry. You just, <laughs> I thought it was getting, well, thought it was getting signals. I mean, what I think, it seemed weird because he seemed sort of okay with coming in at that point. But then what sort of happened is that he came out in fifth and then got really angry. It was made me think he didn't know he was going to come out in fifth in the race. But, I mean, obviously there's the adrenaline going on. But after the race, that he had to... He didn't have to... Everyone was blowing, like, the messages up. It's like... I'd say that there was a lot of criticism of Hamilton for how he, like, spoke on the radio. And do you think that's justified or fair? Um... The thing is, I think we should also like be familiar with the fact that Formula One drivers they've been under immense, in tremendous stress and adrenaline, and they're running under loads of adrenaline after 58 laps of what is very cautious driving and a lot of tense nerves, like fatigue, and then on on top of that, this is in the spur of the moment as well. So you can't really blame Hamilton for saying something that potentially may get him criticised. Because at the end of the day, they're human. We they, we don't know what they what the emotions they're going through. And yeah, it's just they're not in a fully conscious mindset because they've literally been under two hours of constant five G forces. It takes a toll on a driver. Yeah, and there was a lot of like comparison with the crit or with uh, the criticism of Hamilton to sort of some of the other um, some other drivers, like both at this race and the last race. So we had uh, Kimi Raikkonen in practice, sort of having a go at his engineers because obviously water had escaped his uh, 
his drinking pipe. He'd, he'd found too much of the drink. But he, um, so, and then he had a go at his engineers. But everyone, everyone's always been, like, quite, uh, hap- or not happy with the Kimi, like, abrasiveness. But they're fine with it. And then, even at last race, we had sort of the same situation. We had a driver in first place, in Lando Norris, who did like, end up shouting at his engineers, obviously, because it was, like, really stressful, as you said. And... It just seems weird that people criticise Hamilton as opposed, or and not criticise them because, to be honest, I don't think anyone should be criticised. These dri- like, they've been in the car for almost two hours at this point, driving at a hundred and average of like one hundred and seventy miles an hour for fifty laps on tyres that aren't really designed for wet conditions. It's and then you've lost positions. It's understandable that you're going to be annoyed. Yeah, I mean, Hamilton gets criticism because he's a winning driver, the same way that Vettel did, the same way that Schumacher did, the same way I'm sure in the future someone else will. Um, And there's not much you can do about that, and it's not worth arguing about, I don't think. Um, You know, yeah, I I get so annoyed when when people take stuff like that out of context or um, think that because that that's a lot of what people have interactions with the driver they hear on the radio um it annoys me more when i hear uh, the 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 team chiefs uh, like trying to suck up to to whoever the race director is um uh, and 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 yeah i think we should focus on that instead like go back to silverstone and com- <laughs> no um yeah hamilton's hamilton's a winning driver he's he's uh, Everyone likes to root for the underdog, and he's very much the opposite of that, so he'll get more flack than anyone else. Yeah. And I was thinking about this before the show. Do you think we'll get to the point maybe where we like we don't get team radio? Because does... Right, so team radio, it's a relatively new like thing that's come in, obviously, because we've got the technology for it now. Occasionally we get like we get like some of the funny moments. We've had like a lot of I don't know I mentioned them before. But we had like a lot of Kimmy, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing and things like that. But do we need it in a way? Well, we've had this conversation before a few years ago, didn't we? Um, and I remember they tried to introduce some rules limiting what you could say on the radio. Um, and I especially remember Jensen Button. I think when he was. Uh, went back to McLaren. Um, he he kind of fell foul of that. Um, and there's some some talk about uh, you know just going back to pit boards or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's just here to stay, isn't it? It's it's a high tech sport, um, and and that's that's part of it. You have to be able to juggle engine modes and 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 you know ERS DRS mm. uh, everything that there is in an F1 car and. That's that's just part of it. I don't think you should take that away because why would you take it yeah, away? I, and what, what, what are the maybe, reasons for Maybe it? I was thinking more that the teams and the drivers have radio, but then we don't get to hear it in a way because then it removes it removes like spur of the moment reactions that can get drivers criticised like unfairly. Yeah, but do you think Liberty Media want to do oh, that? Oh no, they won't. No, 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 no. But I'm just saying, like, if we get, if we're getting it to the point where drivers are getting criticised for what they're saying at what 170 miles an hour in like the heat of battle, they've just lost two positions in wet. It's probably cold. It's difficult to drive, and they're getting judged and criticised on that. It doesn't really like seem like productive to have that sort of thing or maybe do you think just liberty need to be a bit more careful with what they put out live maybe maybe but some i think i like i like team radios in that respect because i, li- I like how drivers react and the spur of the moment when something goes wrong because i really because it for some in some ways it does help pe some people reconnect with the drivers and what they're feeling during a race. It kind of creates that, helps create that personality for drivers. Because in the past, Formula One drivers have sort of had that little reputation for being nothing more than a racing driver. But I think, personally, I think Team Radio over the years has kind of helped craft that personalities in racing drivers that shows them that they are, they are human. They are, they have feelings. Yeah. I think. Possibly, I think the takeaway I take from it is maybe Liberty need to be 
just a bit maybe recognize the possible consequences of what they put out or we just need to make people better but that's that's never gonna happen yeah twitter beef needs to chill out that's all ban twitter (laughs) (laughs) ban all f1 fans (laughs) it is the show is over goodbye it's it's getting it's getting to the it's getting to the point where it's a bit uh it's getting a probably a bit far but I guess we'll move on from that. And the gap now is, oh gosh, you six, no, yeah, yeah, six yeah, points. Six points between Verstappen and Hamilton. It's not got over eight since I want to say Hungary. Silverstone. Silver. It's not got over eight since Silver. That was a while ago. So this, like, this is the closest championship we've probably had since I'd say twenty ten. Maybe 2012. 2012. Yeah, yeah, I think 2012. But this might is, count. but this is getting to the point where we are. Like we're talking about these championships with the 2010s, the 2012. Some of the best championships in the last two in the, of this century, and 2021 is up there. The gap six points from Verstappen to Hamilton. Verstappen retaking the championship lead. Do you think that overall, like let's say on Thursday, Mercedes just announced they've taken the 10 place grid penalty. Do you think they're happy that the gap, with the gap how it is now? Do you think they're satisfied that this was a case of damage limitation and that they're fine with only being six points behind? I mean, <laughs> they're never going to... I mean, yeah, obviously they'd want to be like 30-odd points ahead, but realistically... They want to be 100 points yeah, ahead, don't they? But... Yeah, realistically, do you think they're f- like fine with what happened? I mean, if you're going from Thursday to Sunday, ignore everything that happened in the middle, I, I'd say take it, um, especially the Bottas win, um, because that does a great deal more for Hamilton than Hamilton getting up to, to P2, isn't it? So there was so Verstappen scored eight more points than Hamilton, right? Yeah. But that's almost the same gap. Well, it's the, one, it's that, the same yeah, gap as if fast, he won and yeah, fastest lap. Yeah, and win. Yeah, so... Um, yes, I'd be happy with that because Bottas has put it on pole um, and then he's won the race. I mean, yeah, solid. Do, you, do you agree? Yeah, I think I've got nothing really more to add there, really. Yeah, I mean, I think on balance, probably a good, yeah, a good result without the possibility of like a third that's got away from them, either through bad strategy calls, through just mismanaged like tyre strategy. I think six points after a 10-place grid penalty is something that Mercedes are happy with. But we will come back after after the break and we will talk about just more of a team's championship and especially Mercedes and Red Bull and whether Christian Horner is right to say that he's surprised that Mercedes have just got so much quicker. But... Back to the sport and back to uh, two team, the two teams at the top of the sport, uh, Mercedes and Red Bull. And what Christian Horner said after the race. So he said that he found it, I think it was surprising at how much pace Mercedes had gained over the last few races. So we've had um, over the last few races, we've had Italy, we've had Russia and now we've had Turkey. And I would say that at each of the races, Mercedes were looking a bit more dominant than they had originally have. But do you think that Horner was right to say, or right to, and I quote, express his surprise at the gains he thinks Mercedes have made with their engine performance? To be fair, I think he's kind of just trying to... Some, somehow find that there may be some sort of bending the rules that the Mercedes are doing or something but at the end of the day this is Christian Horner we should always take most of the time we pretty much take what he or he or Helmut Marker says with a pinch of salt anyway yeah I mean we have so obviously over the last few races each of the I'd say each of the top three drivers or if we're taking the top four to be the Red Bulls and the Mercedes. Three of the top four have taken new engines. We've had uh, Bottas at Italy and then again at Russia. We've had Verstappen at Russia and now we've had Hamilton at Turkey. So they've all got like the best engines that they can have in their cars. But 
do you think that Horner, like, he said, obviously, you said there was probably the intent that he's implying cheating. He's, he's, that's it definitely what he is. Oh, I can't say definitely, don't sue me. But, but I would say that, that, I would say that that's, like, heavily, heavily implied. Obviously, the, these, the team principals don't say these things without sowing the seeds in the mind of the FIA. And to be honest, Mercedes have done it earlier on in the season I think it was the French Grand Prix Hamilton was again surprised at how much the Honda engine had improved in the Red Bull but do you think that Horner is right Jack in what he said that he should be surprised before I answer that I need you to fill me in or try and fill me in or just remind me uh, where are Mercedes engine tokens sorry where are Mercedes development tokens and oh, was that just nice. off season, or can they keep developing right. the car this year? On so like, I'll do some research. Like, what 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 is the accusation of cheating if that's not the case? Oh no, they've upgraded the engine. Um, I mean, mm. that's, that's the same with what Ferrari have done, right? There's no need to declare that this engine is slightly so more tuned than the last. Is according there? As to far the as B- I'm aware? according to the BBC Sport article that I definitely didn't use as all of my research for this segment. Uh, under Formula One's rules, the title rivals are not allowed to improve the power of their engines in season. Which, hang on, I saw Ferrari have just done that. Yeah, but their engine develop. Sorry, their development tokens must have gone on the engine, surely. Oh, because um, they they only had two places they could change it. I'm reading. Right, I'm not. Mm. Okay, so Does that right, right yeah. to you. Oh, is it? I swear the engine power units, they're actually separate from the tokers, and the tokers are meant to do with the main structural elements of the car. The power units are a bit separate. No, no, I'm sure they. Were, I'm sure the, the tokens referred to the the parts, because obviously last year Ferrari's engine was shocking, and it was like they have to develop the engine, um, because otherwise, you know, at, at the cost of aerodynamics. Maybe it's certain parts... So obviously we've got our overall power unit and maybe it's maybe it's the ICE they can't upgrade. And then you, or like the internal combustion engine. And then you've got the MGUH, MGUK and things like that that might be able to be upgraded. We really we probably should know this. But um Mercedes have sort of come back and said that they're doing it's because they were managing reliability. And we have seen, they have been saying that for quite a few races now, that the Mercedes engines of the past haven't been, or they obviously of the past, the Mercedes engines were supremely reliable. Like, it was ridiculous how reliable they were. I don't think Hamilton, from 2016 to now, so since the, since the um, advent of the wide cars, I want to say Hamilton has retired due to engine issues once, in 2018 Austria and I can't think of another time that he has I mean to be honest from 2018 Austria he hadn't retired he hadn't retired from a race from 2018 Austria until obviously the Italian Grand Prix this year and that was due to a crash but so maybe maybe it is reliability maybe you turn the engine down to hold some reliability but then obviously once you get a new engine and you're planning on using it for six or seven races, you can, rather than sort of maybe the 10 or 11 that they were trying to do at the start of the season, you can start to turn that engine up. You can start to use a bit more power over the weekend. Obviously, we know that Mercedes had the party modes that, that, that were banned this year. So maybe it, maybe it's just because they were managing reliability. Now they don't have to so much, so they can go a bit quicker. Okay, episode three or four of Jack's conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, let's say Mercedes in the last few years have only been running at 90%. What do you reckon to that? Like this year, they're, they're so worried about uh, Red Bull that they've pushed the engine too hard. Ooh. Is that possible? Could very well be. <laughs> could very well be a possibility, especially with the strains this year. <laughs> I think it could be. So... Right, so Mercedes have been dominant since 2014. 14 to 16, they didn't really need to run the engines that hard. Obviously, 14, first year, you were going to get engine difficulties. I know Hamilton retired from Australia. I think he retired from a few more races, maybe, I think it was Canada as well, 2014. 15 and 16, you're getting into the engines, 
I think they was they were very reliable those years. Obviously, we had the infamous like Malaysia 2016 that and when the engine blew up and probably cost Hamilton the championship. 17 to 19. It, I mean, it is possible that they could have been running at 90 percent. Obviously, those titles were sort of wrapped up quite early on, despite the fact that when we remember to them, or when we look back on them, they were really close for the first half of the season. Like, but then, obviously, 17, uh, it was sort of, it was a combination of reliability and Singapore. 18 almost ended a bit earlier because of, obviously, Vettel in Germany. I think there was a few other instances. 19, again, ended a bit early because uh, Ferrari, or people clocked on to the fact Ferrari were definitely not cheating. But they, we all think they were. And then 20, like they were in a league of their own, so they don't have to run the engines anywhere near the max capacity. I think it is a possibility, but I do, like, even if they're running at, let's say, 80% capacity to try and squeeze those two engines to go the entire season so they don't have to take a grid penalty, now they can run at maybe 90%. Because whereas when they would have running at 80%, you have to go, and we're trying to do two engines, they have to do 10 races. And, or 11 and 11. Now, they've got what? It's so it'd be six, seven races that Hamilton would run his engine for. So that's, yeah. four, that's four less races. So they can afford to maybe turn it up a bit. And to be honest, with this title being as close as it is, maybe that is the, maybe that is the thing that have pushed them over the line in terms of gaining an upper hand on Red Bull. Mm. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it could it could very well be what you just said about Mercedes turning up their engines and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think Mercedes' reliability issues I think did spring from last year itself because twenty last year Abu Dhabi they did actually have to turn the engines down for reliability issues. That was part of the reason why Max Verstappen absolutely dominated that race as well. And yeah, that was and yeah, partly Hamilton had just recovered from COVID nineteen as well. But yeah, I suppose with especially with this championship battle going right down to the wire, especially relative for the last four or five years now, with only seven races, six seven races to go now, and the fact that the championship battle literally is split between six points, which we haven't really seen since 2012. So, us yeah, I could probably see and definitely relate to why Mercedes can push the engines up right to the limit now. I'm going to have to get more creative with my conspiracy theories, aren't I? Next week, um, (laughs) Nikita Mazepin and his father are the same person. Um, No, but uh, realistically, if if I uh, try and bring it a little bit back to earth, um, Mercedes have probably got the best engine on the grid, right? You, yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're nodding. They agree. (laughs) Um, And the last three tracks have been pretty good top speed tracks, right? Yeah. Yeah, again. And we don't have the information that Red Bull have on speed traps and everything. So, and frankly, even if we did, what, what would we say? Like, <laughs> the the speed trap in Monza is in a completely different place to where it will be in Sochi and, and, and again um, elsewhere. So all we've got really is Red Bull's word for it. Um, and that's not likely to be too reliable, is it? Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned that. Obviously, we've had Monza. Like the temple of speed. I think that you sort of need a quick engine, and we saw McLaren out there taking that one too. We had Sochi, where Mercedes have won every race since the hybrid era. One of they they've done that at one other track, Suzuka. So that's another track that uh, Mercedes have always dominated that, and it's again another track that we saw a Mercedes engine car do really well at in Lando Norris. And then we come to Turkey. Which, I guess, obviously, no one really knows how it should have gone. Because now it's probably going to be off the calendar. 2020 wasn't very representative. And and then, obviously, we have this year. So, it is a possibility. But I think the only way you can know it is by being part of the team, isn't it? Well, yeah. And somehow being privy to what the other teams think as well. Um, you... you... You know, Mercedes got some information about the Red Bull strengths and weaknesses, but they're not going to have all of it. Um, so we're going to have to see if they can capitalise on on what they do know. Um, are we 
Where, where are we going next for the show, Will? <laughs> so I don't want to. I don't want to spoil things. We're right. going to. So yeah, what we'll do is we'll talk about some other performances, and then we will come on to uh, the U.S. Grand Prix review, where we look at whether. I mean, that's another track that Mercedes should be good at. So we look at whether perhaps they'll continue their or Red. What Red Bull think is their run of strong engine performance. And we are back on Raw 1251 AM with your host, Will Kingswood, and back on the Work F1 show, where we're just going to finish up, finish up talking about the Turkish Grand Prix by looking at some of the some of the performances that we haven't really mentioned before. So, or before, we haven't really we haven't really mentioned during the show. Starting with, I mean, I'd say a deserved driver of the day, Carlos Sainz, who came from 19th. On the grid to 11th, of 11th, 8th. He gained 11 positions. That's what, I, that's what I had in my brain. Yeah, I mean, there were we could we could talk for quite a while on this GP. I feel like, um, but yeah, Carlos Sainz definitely one you could talk about um, for 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 a little bit at least. Um, he was a bit like Hamilton, wasn't he? Right at the start of that race, he was absolutely motoring through people. Um, we've seen the Ferrari engine upgrades recently, and clearly that's worked for him. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the first fifteen to twelve, or the first fifteen to twenty laps, you were seeing a Hamilton overtake, and then a science overtake, then another Hamilton overtake, then a science overtake. I think by, I think it was like lap eighteen, he was already into tenth. So that's like, if you do that, if you do the math, it's like one point eight overtakes a lap, which that is in a Ferrari, which is a midfield car, that is incredibly impressive. Oh yeah, especially. Yeah, especially with the Ferrari, not even with this new Ferrari, Ferrari engine, the car is not known for being a fast car in a straight line. And to be, and yeah, so we saw it with Claire being able to keep up with Verstappen, even with the new unit. But in the dry, we still need to probably see how good this engine is. But I'm just more happy fact that more happy about the fact that Science actually got TV time with his overtakes. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's always. I feel like Carlos Science. And we've said this before, has been lost in the shuffle. We've we have the we have the old guard. We have the the whole. We have the like the Vettel, the Raikkonen, even though he's retiring this year. Hamilton, Alonso, the world the world champions. We've got, uh, and I may maybe include Daniel Ricciardo in that because he's been around for a while. Then you've got the then you've got the new guard. You've got your Norris, your Russells, your. Albans when he returns to the grid. I guess even like Latifi, Schumacher, probably Verstappen, even though he's been on the grid for quite on the grid for quite a while, he's still quite young. But then you've got we've got there aren't really that many drivers in the middle. As we mentioned earlier in the show, there's Sainz and there's Bottas, and maybe like you move Ricardo back down depending on how you're feeling. But Sainz has been lost in the shuffle. But he's really he's really performing this season. He's level on points with Leclerc now. Yeah, I mean, they've got half a point between them if you want to be really annoying. Um, <coughs> spa, annoying. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a perfect storm for Carlos. Uh, when you think about Vettel leaving, who was pretty well-loved at Ferrari, um, the fact that Sainz himself has left McLaren, who are one of the best-loved teams on the grid, uh, and he's gone to a team where it's not about the social media presence so much, you know, McLaren have to be out there. Their unbox stuff is there to give an insight. But Ferrari are probably the one team on the grid where it's like history. You've got to be, you know, you 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 traditionally can't say that the car is. You can't say the car is bad. We're we're the best team on the grid. There's a little bit of pomp about them, and maybe that doesn't quite doesn't quite suit Carlos. But that's only on the that's only on the media side. That's on the external facing side. When he gets in that car, he's just as competent as Leclerc. Yeah, and I mean, we'll come on to Charles Leclerc now, because, again, he had a very good race. Like, that Ferrari engine is working. He uh, qualified fourth, because I'm including Hamilton on pole, regardless of how it is. Obviously, he started third. Held third for, I guess, the majority of the race. Obviously, overtaken by Perez at the end, but it was a Red Bull versus a Ferrari. He probably did pit too late to um to 
sort of like hold uh, that Red Bull behind him. But I mean, just a very, very good performance again from the other Ferrari. I mean, yeah, I think I think this is the first race in a little while that we've actually seen the true pace of Charles Leclerc and what he can do in the car that's that's not. Let's say that Ferrari was out of place, being third, literally being consistent two, three seconds behind behind Verstappen. I mean, that's a feat in itself. The Verstappen in a in what is you can say top two fastest cars in the grid versus the Ferrari, which is probably the fourth fastest behind the McLaren, and to keep it that consistent distance behind him, and even all and even like almost kind of challenge Perez until Perez obviously did overtake because fresher tyres and stuff. But yeah, it was a very, very solid race for Leclerc, even though I would, I really did want him on the podium. Yeah, I mean, when was the last time Leclerc got a podium? I want to... He must... I feel like he's got one this season. I just can't remember when. We'll come back to that, right? Well, I'll do the reset. <laughs> oh no! But yeah. yeah, I mean Charles Leclerc. I mean, just give us or give us your take on on his performance. Yeah, it was it was solid. I think um, I'm going to debate whether that Ferrari is actually the fourth fastest car on the grid. We'll come back to engine and upgrades again. It feels like I've talked about nothing else, but um, yeah, no, that that that's helped him. He had strong qualifying, which he does traditionally anyway, which is good. Um, and he put together a solid race. There was, there's plenty of risk um, in the wet, and he just. So few drivers actually spun it. Really, when you think about it, there was, it was a good performance like across the field. But he held his position well. Yes, okay. Mm. Strategy maybe didn't quite work out in his favour. I think Perez, when Perez pitted, was almost ideal to be honest. Um, but yeah, he he handled the graining, and then when the tires started coming back to him, he drove away from Hamilton. So that was that was good from him. I don't think Leclerc was really helped by Ferrari either. I mean, the engineer is saying just stay in front of. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> that, I mean, yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I think just the Ferrari master plan coming straight through there. I mean, I can't imagine what his face must have been like. So Leclerc's last uh, last podium was the British Grand Prix, where he was again actually lost a position in the final in the final few laps, going from first to second. Obviously, when Hamilton um, overtook him at Cops Corner, the infamous Cops Corner this season. But I mean, we'll move on to the other side of the. Battle for third place, McLaren, who just wasn't wasn't a very good, very good uh, like race for them. I mean, we so we had Norris qualifying. I want to say seventh, sixth. I think he, I think he probably With, he qualified eighth and then was seventh on the grid, wasn't okay. it? I think. So started seventh. I think I'll give you points. I think that's right. Mm. I'll give you points. Started seventh, one. finished seventh, and but Ricardo, ooh. The qualified or well, so qualified 16 so knocked out in q1 took an engine penalty and then just ra- like unlike science he was just scything his way through the field i think ricardo got stuck in 15th or so he was, I mean, sat, he was sat behind russell for god knows how long hmm. wasn't he i mean i think he got up there in the end because he pitted earlier and he was able to overtake a lot of the cars when they pitted and were obviously going through that graining phase. But, I mean, what happened to McLaren this race? Yeah, I mean, you can say it's an overcut, but you, like, he pitted so far in front of everyone else that um, you could barely call it that. It wasn't that they were going through the graining phase, it's just that they'd been driving slightly slower tyres for a while. Mm. Um, yeah, no, it was it was terrible for, for Ricardo. Um, I think Norris did the best with with what he had. Um, it's just, I guess it's not a good track for them. I'm not really sure where where McLaren is strong and where they are not. Do not seem to line up with the other top speed car on the grid, or the, or the top of the grid, which is Mercedes. So I'm so I'm just a little confused. So they they've said that. Well, I think Crofty said in the commentary that McLaren say that they're bad at a lot. Uh, uh, tracks with a lot of medium speed corners okay. which thinking of the tracks they they were good at sort of makes sense 
So we got Mon. Mon yeah, they won at Monza. Monza's obviously a lot of low and high speed. Corners. Yeah, it's either hard braking or it's flat out, isn't it? Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Austria, a lot of high speed corners. Yeah, mostly high speed in Austria. Uh, Sochi. Sochi's a bit of an. Well, it's low speed sector one. Yeah, and the I last sector's pretty maybe low that's, as well. I think we think I think probably sector one of Turkey is like the, the like quintessential medium speed corner. It's not like a twisty sector three, but it's more like just slow, like hundred, hundred and twenty kph corner. So maybe that's why they were bad. But I mean, it's it's a bit weird to see McLaren just not have a have an off day, especially after a few good races or. The last two races they've had a bit really good. I mean, if Nor- Norris almost gained the win at Sochi, Danny Ricardo doing a master drive in Monza, and then just to see him literally as a properly average team in this weekend was very, very bizarre. Yeah, I mean, there's not really much else to say. They just had a bit of an off day and sort of allowed Ferrari to come back into the constructors' battle. But we'll talk about one more one more incident, unless uh, my two uh, guests here can think of any more. And that is the Turn 1 incident between Gasly and Alonso. Ooh, we're right which, the way back to the start. <laughs> for which, uh, yeah, we'll start, we'll start at the start. Or we'll finish at the start, sorry. Uh, so Gasly, going into Turn 1, got Perez on the inside, sort of has to drift out wide, tags Alonso, spins as him, and gets a five-second penalty. Fair? I'm... What do you think? Uh, I think I've expressed my opinions on penalties in the FIA before, but I'll go for a. Uh, do you want the? Do you want the full? Do you want the full lowdown on on my opinions? Have yeah, we got time for yeah, it? Yeah, we got All time. right, here we go then. We, I'll, I'll warm up. Um, essentially, the FIA have taken the position um, that the penalty doesn't depend on the consequences, except for the fact they haven't taken that decision at all. Because we saw later on signs hit Vettel in an incident that was very much his fault, but because neither of them were affected, there was no penalty given. So, in that situation, if they judged that Gasly was at fault, then they did the right thing in giving a five-second penalty, but they should remain consistent. So, signs should have received a five-second penalty. Maybe Hamilton at Cops should receive a five-second penalty. Or... They should do the complete opposite, and they should judge it entirely based on the consequences. So, Hamilton should have been disqualified, Sainz should get no penalty, and in this place, if they judge Gasly at fault at least, he should get, I don't know, a drive-through, so he goes to the back of the field. That's that's where it's at. So, I guess the question... You were really just asking whether I thought Gasly was at fault, really, aren't um, you? But I think... No, I think what I've put... I would, I would sort of say what I think about it. I think, like, Gasly was at fault. Like, it's pretty undeniable, obviously. He spun Alonso. But it's... T- A, it's term, term one, lap one. We've ha- we've seen a lot of, like, incidences that have been given, like, no no fault. This one wasn't entirely Gasly's fault either because, obviously, we had Perez on the inside... Uh, and he had to leave him space, and then obviously if you do that, you're going to start drifting out wide, and you're going to tag anyone that's coming on the outside. But then uh, what we saw later on in the lap, Alonso just punting Mick Schumacher, and he got the same penalty for it. So I think either give Alonso a bigger penalty, because that was that was especially like there was no reason that was that was a hundred percent Alonso's fault. There's no like mitigating circumstance it's not like turn one it's not got a car on the inside and give him a greater penalty or you give him the same penalty and give Gasly no penalty because I don't I think it was just a racing incident but it was a racing incident that had worse consequences than a lot of other racing incidents that we see no I don't I don't think there's I don't think there can be gradation on how much fault there is it's it's either judged as one driver's fault and they get the penalty, or no driver's fault, and it's no penalty. Um, I think it has to be like that. Uh, and you, I mean, you're kind of yeah. What what do you think, Jim? Because um, he's nodding, and I want I want support on this. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think especially this. I'd say this year the FIA has been very very inconsistent. I mean, 
they gave the same penalty to Gasly. Like, like we talked earlier, he was almost sandwiched with Perez and Alonso. And yeah, it was Gasly's fault that he did tag Alonso, but there's not too much room for Gasly to move around. Whereas we saw Alonso punting Mick, and that was 100% Alonso's fault. He 100% deserved a penalty. And then, if, the, if to be fair, if the, if, if the FIA was going to give penalty to Gazi and Alonso, theoretically they should have also given a penalty for Sainz because he also did clip into Vettel and it wasn't exactly the cleanest of overtakes as well. Yeah. I think the problem is it's very hard to eliminate consequences because although the Sainz Vettel one was clumsy, like realist, it didn't make a difference. And I know they're trying to say that it that it won't make a difference, but it's almost like... There's two different types of incident. It's like there's incidents where uh, like both drivers emerge unscathed. It was a bit clumsy. We banged the wheels a bit. And then you've got incidents where like one driver ends up in a bad situation. And th- those incidents have like varying degrees of severity. So you go from a Alonso spins out, immediately gets going and drops to the back of the field, but he's like right behind the back of the field. To probably and yeah, ending up to yeah Hamilton Verstappen spinning off at 180 miles an hour at Cops Corner. If if I can make this a little bit m- more philosophical, which is a, a weird thing to say in an F1 podcast, but I think it depends on what you think the penalties are there for. Is it there for like recompense or like revenge, mm. or is it there to dissuade the drivers? In which case. You should say that Sainz should be dissuaded from driving over the curb, losing control of his car and careening into the Aston Martin, right? Yeah. Even though it didn't wipe out uh, Vettel. Um, yeah, in my in my mind, that's how it should work. Um, maybe 10 seconds penalty for Hamilton because it's a high-speed corner and you want to dissuade him more from creating that situation um, because it's a high-speed corner. But it shouldn't be because of the consequences of that. Maybe he should have received 10 seconds because he did the same thing to, the, to Leclerc at Silverstone. Yeah. You know? Um, or you can just... You know... I don't like the way the FIA goes on about it. Again, I, I will... I'm going to shut up so now. Because I, I could be on... I could be be still going until next week. Yeah, show. this could be another one of your shows. I'll be talking just talk <laughs> penalties. Like... Just think. I've got two ideas now. Let's go. Yeah, Come just think, think of the 2021 penalties and we look at like which ones we think are the harshest, the fairest, the l- most lenient. But I mean, Jim, do you want to add, any, add anything else? I mean, is this? I mean, is this a fine line? Is that like you got the safety of the drivers, but then on the top of that, you won the close racing. You've won the action. That's what Formula One is all about. At the end of the day. Yeah, I mean. <sighs> Come on, where's your head cannon penalties? What what would you <laughs> if if you didn't right, know yeah. what if you didn't actually? Know what was... So the th- we'll we'll do the three incidents. All so right. we'll do side so, right. What is your penalty for Gasly and Alonso, Alonso and Schumacher, and then Sainz and Vettel? So Chimay, I'll come to you first. Actually, so actually we'll do we'll do it one more. So Gasly and Alonso, what is everyone giving? as a penalty so jack five seconds five seconds five five seconds personally i think a racing incident but that's our opinions so then alonso and schumacher later on in lap one five seconds five maybe ten if i'm being too harsh but i think i think that one's a like clear cut five i think very obvious and then finally science and Vettel. Five seconds. <laughs> Probably just signs giving the position back to Vettel. I hadn't, oh, okay. Actually, I hadn't yes. thought of that. Right. That is good. I'd still get five seconds, but... <laughs> I think, yeah, actually, they that, that is an idea they could bring in more. If it's not a fair overtake, like if it's a bumping wheels, it's, very, it's a bit clumsy. Give the position back. Because it, like you, you do lose time and things like that. Yeah, from a fairness standpoint, you're probably right. I'm not sure if it would make for better racing. Do you want a job at the FIA? (laughs) (laughs) I don't mind. (laughs) Yeah, so actually, that is, I think that is what I, so yeah, that is a good idea. 
I just need the story. The story real because that that is perfect. You give the position. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you saying? <laughs> I, 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 he, he, I would give I would give those those uh, three penalties to Chinmay. And speaking of giving points, oh, I, oh no. I am <laughs> segwaying. That is a terrible segue. No. <laughs> After the break, we will be looking at our predictions for the Turkish Grand Prix as well as making some new ones for the US Grand Prix taking place uh, two weeks from now. But. And we are back for the final segment that was Last All Night by Oliver Heldens featuring Kay Stewart. And we're back with our predictions. And the actually, we'll preview the US Grand Prix first. So the track came on the calendar, Austin, Texas, came on the calendar in 2012. And it's, it's a bit of a Hamilton stronghold, wouldn't you say? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, to be honest... <laughs> It's it's been off the track. It's, it's sorry, it was off the calendar last year, and uh, that's just like that's enough for it to go completely out of my brain. So yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> twenty nineteen felt like seven years ago. Now. Yeah, I've had to look it up. I, I, how how you, has your memory, Shamil? Um, all I remember was Valtteri Bottas just doing that really good overtake on Hamilton. He was like to his radio guy, like, no more talking until he overtook Hamilton. That's all I pretty much remember from it, to be honest. And Lando Norris with his, I'm moving up and down, side to side, like a roller coaster. With his, that, that, Do you remember the memes? I remember the yeah, memes okay. from it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to that find... Was, that wasn't... The winners. Hang on. 2019 was Bottas, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Bottas. Yeah, yeah. So... So from so I will read out the winners quickly. So came on to Austin, cam, comes onto the calendar in twenty twelve. Hamilton wins that year. Vettel taking uh, one of his nine consecutive wins at the end of the season in twenty thirteen. Then fourteen to seventeen, all Lewis Hamilton, all Hamilton victories. Twenty eighteen, Kimi Räikkönen taking his final final win after I want to s- about. 113 races, I think, since 2013 Australia yeah. or something. And then, obviously, as you said, Valtteri Bottas winning the race in 2019. So, I mean, five wins for Hamilton and then one each for Vettel, Raikkonen and Bottas. And realistically, two of them aren't going to win it unless the race is especially crazy. So... Uh, don't don't do Bottas dirty like that. He might win. Oh, <laughs> that, Im- that implies he's like well, okay. Now who out of Vettel and Raikkonen is going to win? I know I've dug myself a hole here, haven't I? Yeah. Uh, Ra- uh, Raikkonen. Raikkonen. So, <laughs> but since 2014, uh, all Mercedes except for obviously the Raikkonen victory in 2018. And we'll talk about the track quickly. It's a good good track. One of Tilka's better ones uh brilliant turn one like that turn one is iconic oh yeah i love it straight uphill boom left under it's, it's, it's just it's just odd isn't it yeah but straight it, it really stands out it's one of the ones it's one of those turn ones that's almost better to start second in because it's not that the run is short it's that because it's uphill you can break like a lot later and then the uh apex just opens up i remember i think hamilton forcing Rosberg it was off the track in 2015 and Raikkonen getting Hamilton in 2018 to obviously go on and win then first sector very like Silverstone-esque like Maggots Beckett's that sort of thing like turn I think two three four and five I want to say yeah something like something like that and then obviously drop down onto the back straight which almost a perfect length really yeah, it's really, it's really, really long. Good. It's not too massively long, but it's just long enough that it provides really good side to side action with a good overtake. And it definitely the left hander. It's definitely a good, uh, good turn for an end of a straight. Yeah, and then we get into the final sector. A bit of a Tilka final sector, a bit twisty. Obviously, we've got uh, another turn eight. One of the turn eight rip offs that. He always tried to do with oh it might, uh, I don't know the corners but you can you see it right at the end and um, a notable moment Verstappen trying to overtake uh, Raikkonen up the inside but essentially cutting the corner so he had to give well, I think he got a five second time penalty in the end so lost that podium but yeah that's the end of the lap I would actually 
One thing I do is I encourage everyone to look at what indie car called track limits of that track. <laughs> because it is absolutely... They don't have track limits. It's People out, will run on the grass if they could. It's outrageous how wide they go at the second to last corner. It's just, It upsets me to no end. But before we do our predictions for the US Grand Prix, we need to do look at our predictions for the Turkish Grand Prix and see whether Raw, the Raw side will take a 2-0 lead or... The Warwick F1 side will take a, or will uh, level it up we'll, we'll one or We will. We'll, we'll, I'm, so I'm, sure we, we, I'm sure we've predicted marvellously. Right, we'll try and be as non-biased as possible. So, oops. for Raw, we had Hamilton, Verstappen and Norris in the top three. And the F1 society had Verstappen, Leclerc and Norris. And I'm going to say we win that. Hang on, so you had... So we had Hamilton, Verstappen, Norris... We got one right in the correct position. You had Verstappen, Leclerc, and Norris. Also one right, but in the wrong position. I feel yeah. like I feel like it's pretty cut and dry here. Well, it's it's not just those. And to be fair, well, yeah, but Leclerc was fourth, and that was reasonably out there. But then I put Mercedes in first. We can argue this all day. So we'll come on to we'll come on to the actual uh, just random predictions that we made throughout the weekend. So. We had, or I think uh, Cam Hall predicted them on the raw yeah, side. Yeah, blame, so we had, blame it on Cam. I will blame it on Cam. Uh, we had three Mazepin spins. So I'm pretty sure there were two. I'm going to be honest. I don't think there was three. <coughs> I'm like 90% sure there were two in qualifying. I don't think he spun during the race. I only watched the highlights and I just don't remember either of them. So. I think That's... the only thing Mazepin did the race was block Hamilton with in the oh, flag. Oh, bit. we forgot about that. Oh, that was really. I could have. I saw. I saw a great thing. It was like Mazepin was about twenty centimeters away from inciting Twitter nuclear war. <laughs> but yeah, so I think. I think two. I think I'll give two. So that one hasn't come through. Twenty-five plus DRS overtakes. Seemingly the most safe prediction. Apart from the fact that there was no DRS for the entire race. So that's gone, somehow that's gone really badly. And then two stops at all finishes. And that's also gone badly as well. Yeah, because Cam was like, yeah, it'll be... Uh, no, he didn't predict changeable conditions because he didn't know the weather forecast at that point. But mm. it was like he thought tyre deg was going to be pretty high. So tyre deg was high, but that, but that wasn't the prediction. So we had, we had somehow an average of one stop for the entire grid. Yeah, that's uh, Which is, it's pretty bizarre, that's isn't it? It's probably the lowest amount of pit stops we've had. Yeah, for, especially for if you're only counting finishes, yeah. definitely. Oh, yeah, I mean, it was another race where everyone finished. They, there's, I think it's third time this season. But, like, they used to be quite rare. And then on your side, you had Giovinazzi points, finished 11th, so you actually weren't that bad. McLaren front row, yeah, that, okay, that wasn't brilliant. And then science engine penalty. So you did get that one. So what we've got here is we have got um, a driver in the top three predicted correctly, uh, but no, um, no other predictions. You've got a driver in the top three position incorrectly and one right prediction. What do you think? I think... I don't think you have to get it, like, perfectly correct. Mm. I think we were close enough with Giovinazzi and close enough with Leclerc that... I think, but, to be honest, I think I'll give it to you. I think the okay, fact we were, we were so wrong with the DRS overtakes <laughs> that, that was, we said 25-plus, yeah. there were exactly zero. <laughs> <laughs> Mazepin spins was one off, but I guess that's still, like, 66% of what you need and two stops for all finishes like one yeah it's, like it realistically there should have been we we need to get we need to have a different you know we need to have a better voting system than this we we you do know. We'll, we will think of one we need to i almost think we need to like give one point for a correct position and person we'll we'll come back we'll, we've got we'll, to a we'll come back but i will i will concede defeat <laughs> on this side and the score is now one all between uh, Warwick F1 Society and Raw Sport on our joint 
podcast and we will have to think of a prize slash forfeit for the end of the season <laughs> which will be which will be performed but we'll come on to our predictions for the u.s grand prix so i think i'll go first because i'm hosting and i can <laughs> um so i went for a bit of a boring top three but i do think it will be a bit more of a boring race i can't wait for there to be a hurricane halfway through because with how this season's going it's gonna happen the track will get like transported yeah. to the middle east somehow i don't know yeah so i've gone just a standard handbot for i think mercedes this could be one of their um best tracks this season and to be honest we're probably due a fairly like standard dull race where Mercedes... Well, let's go back to 2014 to 16. But you think Bottas will beat Verstappen? I do. I think the new engine... He's on a high after a win as well. I know it's not. I know it's not World Porridge Day next, in two weeks' time because that's <laughs> oh, it. Oh, stop with me! It seems to be that seems to be his good omen. But then I've gone for <laughs> so I've obviously gone for Hambot Ver. Then I've gone for Ferrari to score more than McLaren. I do think. I think. This could be another of the tracks that McLaren struggle on, especially with Sector 3, baby. And obviously the Ferrari new engines. I've gone for a Hamilton Grand Slam, which wow. is... That, wow, okay. That's, that's, that's my bold. bold one. That's a bold one because, I mean, it could happen. It happens like once every two seasons on average Versta or something like that. Hamilton's last Grand Slam was... Did he... Did, might not have got one in 2020. Might have got. I'll I don't it. know. I know in 2019 Abu Dhabi was definitely one of them, and I think it might be the last one. And then I've gone for a Schumacher Q2 appearance again. Okay. Because I think he can. I'd say Turkey's quite similar to the USA. Eh? If you think about track layout, it's yeah, fairly... but it was rain, wasn't it? It's just not in. Do you oh yeah. Do you think? Oh, I'm back. I'm back. Oh no, I shouldn't have said that. I'm back. <laughs> no, I'm. I'll back. I'll back my predictions. I can't so, change it now. Well, well, we'll think something up. Um, no, no, I'll, well, <laughs> no, I'll back it. I think, okay. I think a Schumacher Q2. All right. Is it similar to France as well? Um, uh, France is a very good can do mix, it. isn't it? I know he can do it. Okay. So those uh, are those are my predictions. And now I'll type these sorry. down. We'll come to what your, your side. Remind me of your second one again. Uh, Hamilton Grand Slam. Oh yeah. What happened? So you're willing to bet like. He's the last pit person in the top five or six that's going to pit. Oh no, I think he just qualifies. I think he just qualifies on pole and then puts in a twenty-second gap, and then realistically, he could be the last one to pit. The problem with Grand Slams these days is it's a lot more difficult to get them. Are you counting the fastest lap or not? Yeah, because that's a Grand Slam. Oh, okay, all right. That is, that's why it's a lot more difficult to get Grand Slams these days, just because the fastest lap actually means something, and obviously people pit for it. But we'll come to your side now while I look for a ham last Hamilton Grand Slam. Okay, so we've actually gone for a similar podium setup, but we um, we thought Verstappen, Hamilton, and Bottas, especially with, like recently, that Mercedes stronghold doesn't necessarily mean Mercedes stronghold. We saw Abu Dhabi last year with Verstappen absolutely dominating, and then we also saw in France where Hamilton's traditionally been brilliant for at that truck ever since he came the Castellet come came back in 2018. But obviously this year Verstappen dominated that race as well. So yeah, there's a good chance that Verstappen can take the better of Hamilton and Bottas in this race. So was it a Verham bot? Yeah, a Verham yeah. bot. <laughs> also, in this championship, it's going to be... It's going to either... It's not going to flip-flop till the end. I don't think it will. And at some point, someone's going to take a surprise victory where they shouldn't. And then I think... I think it could be this weekend. Open up that gap to 15 yeah. points or however much it would be. 16 maybe. Uh, no, other way around. 14. Um, and then and then extend away from there. I well, think I mean, it's possible. You say the next two races are very like yin and yang. Because you've got the yin of like Hamilton. You'd think he'll win at the US. And then Mexico is obviously, a, has always been a Red Bull stronghold. Even when they haven't been as dominant. And... Wouldn't it just be 2021 if uh, if Hamilton won at Mexico and Verstappen <laughs> won at the US Grand Prix? But, I mean, what are your other other three predictions? Uh, we went for Norris top five because, especially this recent run, I mean, this week in the McLaren, was, last week in the McLaren was just not fast enough. So, and Norris was actually pretty strong in the last race 
in the USA as well. Um, Latifi qualifying 18th. It's very, very specific. We were, I, 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 I wanted to do this. Like, yeah, the I was, three, I was having a bit of like Norris top five is quite general, but I'll give it to you with the TP qualifying exactly 18th. Wait, is that 18th before engines or is that 18th after engines? What qualifies? So like, that's his qualifying position, okay, right? Okay, so yeah. yeah, with I will, I would say I'll put in the rules here. If there's engines before qualifying, <gasps> no, should fine, fine, you will. Big, we can argue about it when he qualifies 19th. Sure. The and, and prediction is that in he will be the third from bottom driver to qua- to, to to be knocked out in Q1. Is it, is that okay? That is that so quali- specific right. enough for it's, you? It's just it's qualifying versus starting. He will have the 18th fastest time in Q1. Okay, so qualifies, not starts. Oh. Qualifies with a capital qualifies. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and the final one. And we've got an obnoxious national anthem singer. Obnoxious national anthem singer. It's America. You had to, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> I miss. I miss, I want Michael Buffer back. What year was that? 18, 17, 19? Don't Where remember. Okay, ringside. It's so American. So we'll run through them quickly. I went for Hambot the Ferrari to score more than McLaren, Hamilton Grand Slam, and Schumacher in Q2, whereas the F1 side went for Verham Bot, Norris top five, Latifi qualifying exactly 18th, and an obnoxious national anthem singer, or do you want just the anthem? Well, the, you, you know how they always like. Yeah. They, it's America, they make way too much of the national Have anthem. Have you ever seen that Fergie? Yes. One. I've not watched it and I don't want to because apparently it's <laughs> awful. But, I mean, with that is everything. We've actually, we've actually somehow made that two hours. I think that's a, I think that's a success. Yeah, we, we were, because we've not had advert breaks almost all the way through. No, no, so. we were thinking, we were thinking hour and a half, but I think, I think we've done well. I mean, thank you for, uh, again, helping me host, uh, helping me host Jack. It's an absolute pleasure. It was a great, it was a great GP, and I could complain about it for hours more if yeah, you needed. And we'll be back next week to talk about something that Jack will think up in the um, in the days before. Well, what did I say right at the start? Uh, oh, there was penalties, and then there was something. Yeah, else. I for, I've forgotten the uh, the first one. Oh well, you'll find out next week. We will when you find tune out in. next yeah. week. And thank you, Tinbe, for coming on and being a guest for the second time. Thanks. Yeah, it was a fun talking about Turkey. Another. Just a lot of fun talking about something like as unique as a Turkish Grand Prix in 2021. Exactly. So, oh, yeah, no, no. no I've, I've remembered it. What was it? Next week, we'll be uh, talking about Formula 2 and Formula 3. Oh, oh, that's a good one. Right, go. Make sure to tune in for that. Obviously, next week, F2 and F3 hosted by Jack. And then in two weeks' time, the return of the US Grand Prix after a two-year hiatus. We review that, hosted by me. This has been the Warwick F1 show. This is Raw 12.51am. I'm your head of sport, Will Kingswood, and thank you for listening.